My name is Han. As an international student, born and raised in China, I was raised on the food from my hometown and brought my old eating habits here to Britain. This didn't strike me as odd until I discovered this book, Traditional Food in Yorkshire. For the first time, I found something completely different, and this curiosity pushed me to find out what British food is, and not just from the picture. With no clue of where to start, I'm seeking inspiration from the chefs of University Cafeteria, Zach and Becky. What were you busy with in the kitchen? Uh, today it's Sunday, yeah. so we've been doing Sunday dinners. So oh, it's like some special event. Yeah, well. Every Sunday. Yeah. At home, like almost like every British family have a Sunday roast, like every week. Oh, I heard always, about it, but yeah. I don't really know what it is. Have you ever had it? So it's like you have your meat and then your collection of vegetables, often Yorkshire puddings as well. Gravy. Plenty oh. of gravy, yeah. And it's like kind of end of the week, the family gets together. Yeah, so we like to do it at uni because people are used to having it at home. So oh, yeah, it's quite do nice. it at uni as well, make people feel like they're at home. I never like, eat any proper British food. And I think people still have the sort of like cliche of British food, say something, um, what British food is just like, Fish and chips and stuff. There's so much more than that, really. So, like butchers and bakeries, and there's like, you know, like a lot of traditional desserts, mm -hmm. even like the flowers from somewhere local. If you want to see how something's done from start to finish, um, yeah. actually in York, quite near to here, um, there's a windmill which actually um, it makes flour in the traditional way. Do people still do that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I want to visit that. It's like far away from here. No, it's like literally down the road near the train station. Speaking with Zach and Becky makes me feel bad about my ignorance of food in Britain. I figured that the only way to understand was to experience it for myself. Following the instructions in this book, I will travel around the county, taste the food, and even learn how to cook it, hoping to peel back the layers surrounding the mystery of authentic English and Yorkshire food. The first stop of my journey is this exotic woodmill that Zach and Becky mentioned about, Steve Potts. The chair of Holgate Windmill, a great way of showing me around. There's been a few people over the years who looked after it and been very supportive in stopping it from being knocked down. Uh, there was a guy called David Lodge who was very helpful in trying to stop the council from doing anything bad with it. So oh. it just basically sat here on a roundabout with the door locked until we came along in 2001 and then sort of we started restoring it after that. You know, I lived quite locally, I'm a York lad. A lot of people lived locally and they've seen this windmill for years oh. and they've played around it, they've watched it, you know, they love it a great deal. So when someone came forward with the idea of trying to restore it, it was a really popular suggestion. Um, the windmill's a very simple thing, really. Yeah. As you can see, it's got a, a cap on it, which is always turning into the wind. Yeah. There's a big fan tail at the back, which always turns the cap into the wind. Mm. And on the sails, you'll see individual shutters. So as we operate the striking gear, that opens and closes those shutters. So if we close those shutters now, the sails would be catching by the wind and the oh. sails would turn. It's a very English mechanism. Yeah. You don't find it around the world. It's a very English solution called patent sails. Oh. Um, so it's, a, it's in this mill that was built in 1770, it was constantly refurbished and constantly upgraded like any factory would be. You know, so it, when it stopped in 1930, it was a pretty much the ultimate solution to a windmill in England. So now we're inside of this windmill. Yeah. I'm really excited. Well, it's not working at the moment, obviously, because there's no wind. So yeah. nothing's actually turning. But directly above your head, there's the stones which grind the grain and form the flour. Cool. Wow. At the moment, we're milling a grain called Caruso. This flour is quite a strong wholemeal flour. So everything we put in comes out the other end. There's no wastage. It's, it's really good. Yeah, I mean, the nice thing about it is that we're actually doing exactly the same thing as the miller did in 1770. Wow. You know, we're doing the same process and the same method. So what kind of uh, bakery that this flour can produce? It produces very good bread, um, but you can also use it to produce cakes. You usually would use half white flour and half of the wholemeal flour for things like scones and oh, flapjack. Oh, you can make scones Yes. One other thing I learned from Steve and Allison is the variety of flour usage isn't the only thing that makes traditional British staple food so unique. Combining it with a simple gift from nature can make it stand out even more. That ingredient is milk. According to the book, dairy once formed a much more substantial part of English diet. I got in touch with a Yorkshire dairy farm 
the owner, Gaudi family, are going to show me their milking method and this one peculiar traditional product, clotted cream. We've got 150 dairy cows and we make clotted cream and yogurt on the farm. The clotted cream is a delicacy from the southwest of England, which is where Sue originated from. Huh. So we decided to bring it up to North Yorkshire. Then we started making the clotted cream in 2003. Wow. And, and the yogurt a few years later. You so. talk a, a lot about cl cl clotted cream. I never tried it before. I just like wondering yes. if there's something unique about your product. It is, it's the fact that it's cooked. We cook it for two hours over water, which causes evaporation and that causes the smooth velvety texture and creates a crust on the top. Yeah, do you mind show me how the clotted cream it's been made. That's no problem, we can do that. Yeah, yeah. could we? Like, yeah. can we do it right now? Yeah. Thank you. Come through and we'll show you the day. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Fabulous. Come on, girls, they're ah. so excited about seeing you. <laughs> oh. Come on, girls. Come on. Come on, girls. Come on, girls. So hopefully they know where to go. First thing we do, Hannah, is just make sure these are uh, medicated wipes. We just make sure the teats are clean before yeah, we right. before we put the machines on. Are you going to have a go? Oh, okay. How many how many kids do they have? I, I only have four. Yeah, they have four. Yeah. Oh, okay. clotted cream this morning. So the cream literally just came just from the cow. Well the whole milk comes from the cow. We then separate it into cream and skim. Wow. The skim we make into yogurt and the cream goes into the into the jugs and then we hand pour it into pots and put it in these frames ready for cooking. Okay Han I'll show you the cream being cooked. Yeah. Wow. It changed the color. It's not that. No, it, it it turns from being a white product into this yeah. beautiful yellow color. Yeah, um, it's so pretty. Which is just fantastic. I can smell it like a little bit sweet and warm, like. Yeah, the quality of this product is everything to us. Yeah. You know, it's just it has to be of absolutely top quality. Yeah. You must be really proud of this. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, we're really pleased that it it goes to so many great places. Yeah. Absolutely. It's true that the tools of production could be reformed in different times, but it still surprised me that everything that takes place inside a farm is completely different from the description in this book. With the widespread popularity of processed food and fusion cuisine in Britain, has the attitude towards traditional English food changed? With all these questions, I knew there was one person who could answer them. The author of the book, Peter Breers. After a few days of trying, I finally reached him, and he invited me to his Yorkshire-style kitchen Hello. in Leeds. Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, well, this is a Yorkshire range. They develop about 1850 and this was the sole source of heat in most working houses. The fire heated uh, the room, it also was where you boiled your kettles, it's where you cooked your vegetables, 
Uh, it had a big oven at the side for all your baking, all your bread cakes, and on there you can put your pans and they will boil. To roast, originally they just used to have a long skein of string, give the roast a flick, and every few minutes you have to give it another flick. And then they invented this thing called a bottle jack, and that's got a skein of cord going from there to there inside, and a clockwork motor wound up with a key, and that means that when the skein has gone at the end of its turn, uh, the clockwork motor gives it another flick, and then it turns back in the other direction. So this will run for an hour without having any further attention. Inside his British kitchen, Peter is going to show me the authentic way of making Yorkshire pudding. So these are the ingredients for the Yorkshire pudding. We have uh, plain flour, uh, a pinch of salt, and then put in uh, a couple of eggs and half a pint of milk. Make a hole in the centre, and if you'd like to break in yeah, a couple of eggs. Yeah, happy to help. Yeah. yeah it's and nice. another one. Then a little milk to start off with, and then yep. uh, nowadays you use an uh, electric yeah. mixer, uh, but the old method is just to use a fork yeah. and do it nice and gently so you're gradually drawing in the dry flour. If you do it too quickly, then of course you've got great lumps of flour in the middle. Oh. Uh, the next thing we need is the tin. Uh, so we have a decent size. Uh, Yorkshire pudding tin. Is it hot? Oh, uh, no, hot. that's cold at the moment. And oh. then we take a lump of lard, put that into the tin, and because you've got to be smoking hot before you put the batter in, yeah. that now goes into the oven. And we leave it there until it's heated through and the fat is boiling. Now, the next thing is take out the hot tin. That should be really smoking hot. And then... I can see some smoke. Yes. There. In goes... Wow. The butter. While we're waiting, could you please show me your masterpiece? I wouldn't say masterpiece. Uh, this is routine. With the kind of work I do, there's always uh, books to be illustrated or articles to be written. So that means there's always some, some kind of drawing on the way. So will people still use this range as a regular no. process or...? It's just too much trouble. Right now, people seem to cook something in an electric oven. Very wisely. Uh, I think the, the main criteria is what the, uh, the the product is at the end. With some things like, like baking or with hand skills, it's good to develop those and maintain them because only by doing so can you actually judge the product of modern techniques uh, by maintaining those skills uh, that hopefully uh, producers of second-rate material won't get many sales. And always really impressed by how culinary tradition is all different in different like region. Oh, it is very much so. Yes, I mean in this area we have the Yorkshire pudding and various other puddings. If you go to Sussex it might be completely different. Is that uh, called Sussex pudding? Uh, oh, there are Sussex puddings but they're beautiful things with lemons inside oh. and really good steam puddings. Uh, but it's interesting how if it becomes a totem for that particular tribe, it's like the uh, the Cornish pasty. Uh, the Cornish pasty, as we know it today, originates in, in uh, London in about 1860. Nothing to do with Cornwall. Uh, but, it, of course, it is a Cornish pasty, therefore the Cornish say only we can make it. In Lancashire, they've adopted the black pudding, uh, which was made all over the country. But Lancashire says, says we, we are the, the prime place for making... Uh, black puddings. I never tried black pudding before. Is that similar to Yorkshire pudding? or it's Absolutely not. It's a blood sausage. Oh, it's a sausage. Then why is it called pudding? Uh, because pudding is the early English word for, for gut. Oh. Well, this is one of the illustrations I'm doing for a book on traditional food in Malton. For this, local families to loan the museum uh, their fa handwritten family recipe books. And that meant we got genuine recipes from that area rather than published cookery book recipes. Wow, it's really yes. cool. Tell me more about this Malton. Is this in Yorkshire as well? It's in Yorkshire. It's between York and Scarborough. Malton is in the edge of the Vale of Pickering, which is a very 
fertile area uh, where you can grow really good crops. It sounds like a really interesting place. It's a very interesting place. It is certainly well worth going there. How much time do we have to check the Yorkshire pudding? I think we better go and do that now. I'm already starving. Now get the pudding out. Oh, can I see this, this smoky like thing? Wow, really nice. There we are. Ooh. I try it. And we can't eat it without onion and gravy. And this was always served as a first course. Uh, not as we do today mm. with the roast. Uh, the, the saying was uh, that those who eat most pudding can have most meat because oh. those who ate most pudding couldn't eat any more meat afterwards. Yeah, so it's right. good economy. Right. Anyway, do try. The pudding is soaking really nice in this gravy. Hmm, I gotta say, it's really simple dish. It looks easy, but it's like really complex flavor. Yes. <laughs> There's a Chinese saying, yi fang shui tu yang yu yi fang ren, which means people are shaped by the food cultures around them. And people in Malton are blessed with this fertile soil. Listen to Peter's advice. I'm traveling to this Georgian market town and find out what are their signature dishes. Mornings at Malton are calm and lazy, but not for the food producers. Inside this bakery, the bakers are getting their hands full. Hello. Hello. Hi. I'm here just because I want to know more about British bakery that I know you're really good at. So I want to know something like secret behind the kitchen. Is that alright for you? I can show you some tea cakes. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. Yeah. It's popular in England because people eat it as a bit of a snack and it's really yummy. What I'm going to do now is mold these two pieces of dough so that they're round. Do you do this in China? Yeah. Wow. So now what we're going to do is we're going to roll them out gently. Like two, one at a time? Two at a time. If you um, want to be a real bit, yeah. take it two at a time. Okay. And then we're going to put them on the tray. I'll do another two. I'll just finish this tray off and then we'll do another tray and you can have a go. Oh, great. Before we do anything else now though, what we're going to do, we're going to dock them. So we're just going to use a fork and we're going to go once in each of these. So what is for? Well, that stops them blistering in the oven. Oh, okay. And because we want them to shine when they come out of the oven, because tea cakes are usually shiny, we're going to yeah. brush them with egg. I think you should have a go at this. Oh, great. So you look like an yeah. artist, so we'll have a go. Yeah, if I pass them on to you. Oh, you've got to get right around to the edge. You missed a bit there. Okay. That's it. I've been on stage doing Shakespeare. So you were an actor? Not really, no. Just an amateur. Can and I please, like, say a little? <laughs> oh, impress me. Could be. Oh, I don't want to impress you. Um, oh, grim look night. Oh, night with you, so. O night whoever art when day is not. Alack, alack, alack. And that's it. That's really impressive. I, wow. I, re I really enjoyed it, but I've not done anything since. <laughs> so the next stage, we're going to put them into the oven and they'll take about 10 minutes to bake. From all the celebrations to feasts and fair, the most favorite ingredients is, without a doubt, meat.
We source everything from a 15 mile radius. My customers come in and say, can you do me this, can you do that? And yes, we'll say, if you've got dairy intolerant, gluten intolerant, we can make you a produce to suit you. So you're helping them to have like a more diverse yeah, sort of diet? Yeah, 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 we certainly are. That's what we've tried to do, you see. We try to make it homely and proper. Today it's the second Saturday in every month when it's the food market. Um, we go outside into the courtyard and we do a big barbecue. Can we see how you prepare it? Yeah, you certainly can, yeah, yeah, okay. by all means. We make two or three different produce to sell out there on our own big barbecue. We have our rusty style chicken skewers, which go into tortilla wraps. And these are our burgers, our big steak burgers. Go for it. I think it's going back to a traditional butcher. You used to go in and have your chart and your butcher would tell you what's on offer, where it's come from and everything like that. Even me, people come in, well, how do I cook that? And you can sort of give them a quick five minute cookery lesson and then they come back and say, oh, we did that, it was fantastic. So Individual you will help customers. your dad with yeah. making this? Yeah, every single, every single Saturday, Sunday. It's just a good thing that's a family business because it just, it makes me feel like I'm also included and it, all of my thoughts are in there as well. So it is good. With my knowledge enriched, I'm taking a more challenging mission, cooking an English homemade dish with a head chef. Hello. Hi, come in. Hello. Hi. Hi. The passion that we have in Malton for food rubs off on the students here. The most important thing for me is that people enjoy the day. Cooking should be a social activity. Just come and have some fun and learn some skills. Go away and practice. That's all we ask. How Yorkshire could fish and chips be, but we're not doing traditional fish and chips, we're going to turn it on its head. We're going to make spicy potatoes with smoked fish and a poached oh, egg. Sounds, sounds interesting. Does that sound okay? It's like some traditional like British very, way. Very English it. breakfast. Mm -hmm. And because this dish is for uh, your dinner party or your special guests, we're going to take the beautiful prime bit. Yeah. The fish is smoked, but we're going to warm it slightly while the fish cooks. Yeah. We're going to put a splash a beautiful Yorkshire rapeseed oil into there and yeah. some mustard seeds. Come on, you're doing the cooking, not me. I'm not really good at cooking, I'm really clumsy. That's fine, that's what you're here for. The for recipes me. are different, but the techniques in cooking are the same all over the world. There's only so many ways to cook. You're either frying or you're boiling or you're grilling yeah. or you're putting it in the oven. Yeah. And then we're going to put our cubes of potato in and now you're going to mix slowly so you, and carefully so you don't break those cubes. So we're going to poach an egg. The water is swirling around like a vortex, right into the middle, uh -huh. and the water wraps the white around the yolk. Just bring it out. Oh, it's a pretty egg. Okay. This is looking absolutely wonderful, and it's yeah. ready. We need to get the fish out of the oven, and see if you can smell that beautiful, light, smoky flavour as it comes out Ooh. of the oven. Does that smell nice? It looks so good. It smells really smoky, really nice. So that's really lovely. Let's pop it on the top, see if we can get it on the top. Okay, Ooh, there you go. Oh, now, so you're going to try ready. it. Mm. It might seem that traditional food has been reshaped by the modern lifestyle. But what I really miss is the delicious savour pudding made in an old-fashioned cooking range. And now I'm standing here in the market town with the smell of food around me. British food is no longer an exotic experience. What I found is, it's not the food itself that attracts me, but the people and their passion for their cuisine. The journey doesn't end here, as there is more about British food I'm yet to discover.